Welcome everybody to the American Space Museum. I'm Mark Marquette and so glad you're with us to stay curious. Today, Throwback Thursday, we're going to throw back all the way 175 years to the discovery of the planet Neptune that's behind me here. Officially the last planet of our solar system. There's kind of a parting shot that was taken in 1989 of Neptune by the only spacecraft to visit it, Voyager 2. That's right, it's been almost 40 years since we've seen this beautiful planet up close, and we're going to talk about its discovery here in just a minute. But uh, to kick off Stay Curious, I wanted to thank everybody who's watching our program on Facebook Live and YouTube. I understand it looks beautiful uh, on, on YouTube there at Robert Law's te television in Dundee. I'm looking up here at a monitor myself that we have here in our American Space Museum conference room and uh, hope you saw yesterday's show with Bruce Smith, a British invasion scientist that was tapped by NASA and the, uh, their contractor Bendix in 1960s to come over here and work on the Apollo program. And Bruce had a lot of activity with the heat flow experiments that were on 15, 16, and 17. And uh, just a great interview with a really interesting man. Go back and check it out in our archives at our that you know you're watching here, whatever platform you're on. We're also on Twitch, which is a gaming platform, and can't thank our our engineer behind the scenes, Jessica Galloway. She and her husband Troy are big gamers and have turned us on to a whole new way of presenting you this Stay Curious program. Marty's still on vacation. He might be might be taking the whole week off, uh, but uh, Marty's in great shape, and we'll be back with him next week to help you all stay curious. Can't get along without Marty, my Grumman worker that looked out those, those lunar module windows while he was working on the Cape, putting those together for the fabulous missions to the moon 50 years ago. But we love our, our astronauts in our community. I'm always talking about how much they're doing for our societies in general, spreading the word about space. And today we're gonna wish a happy birthday to this man, Lauren Shriver, 77 years old today. Happy birthday, Lauren. Let me take that out of there. Lauren is 77, born in Jefferson, Iowa. All right, so he's eating some of that good beef from Iowa, I'm sure. Born September 23rd, 1944, 77 years ago. He's a marathon runner, and he carried the Olympic torch uh, during the 1996 Olympic Games in Atlanta. He carried it onto the property of Kennedy Space Center, and uh, Marty Winkle, our cameraman behind the scenes, was one of the people that ignited the cauldron. Marty got the privilege of, of handling that also because he's a big marathon runner. And, uh, of course, Lauren Shriver is a Purdue knot, one of the two dozen astronauts that uh, come from the University of Purdue. And he is shown here famously in space. Uh, we think those are Skittles, right, Jessica? that he's, he's inhaling in space. And we've actually got this picture over by our food section of our shuttle gallery here at the American Space Museum. Three missions, twice a commander, uh, once a pilot, twice a commander. I'd love to ask him about what he did, uh, usually your pilot twice, and then a commander. He deployed the Hubble telescope in uh, 31 years ago. So a big happy 77th birthday. Hope he's enjoying it with family and friends. Lauren Shriver. And that brings us up to, to, to the planet Neptune. That technically another birthday, exactly, and a controversial birthday because you don't know anything about Neptune. You're, I'm, you're probably lucky you know it's the eighth planet of our solar system, and though I think there's nine planets because I'm a baby boomer and love, love Pluto. But uh, technically, this is a huge body, the last large body in our solar system. Uh, Neptune is about four times the size of the Earth at 30,000 miles across, and yet it was so far away, two billion miles away, that it was not ever seen by the human naked eye. We've got the five classical planets, we call them, that were discovered by nobody, by cavemen. Of course, those are Mercury, Venus, Earth, uh, or not the Earth, but Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. And uh, you look down at the ground and see the Earth. But... Uranus was discovered by uh, William Herschel in the early eight, late 1700s by an accident. 
because he saw it moving over a series of nights. And then people were studying Uranus and thought that it was not where it should be. Something gravity behind what was moving it uh, a day or two ahead or hours ahead of where it should be. Believe me, this is astrophysics and science that you cannot change, as Scotty says in Star Trek. You cannot change the laws of physics. So, so everybody knows exactly where things are because of laws established by Kepler and Newton and Einstein and other greats. So we knew something was wrong with Uranus uh, affecting its orbit. So there was two uh, mathematicians, one named Urban Olivier in France and another uh, Johann Adams in uh, Eng uh, uh, England. And they put their pencils to the test and figured out where this unseen planet could be. And uh, this is, of course, the 1840s, and there's no mass communication. Uh, letters were how people communicated. Days later, you were lucky to get a letter uh, from anywhere in Europe in, in a week, probably. So, but, uh, so it came to the Berlin Observatory uh, that Levier sent a letter to the Berlin Observatory to look in this spot for this mysterious planet we think exists. And the astronomer John Gall looked through the big refractor at the, the uh, Berlin Observatory and discovered this planet, uh, Neptune. Now, in the wake of the discovery, there was a heated nationalistic rivalry between the French and the British over who deserved discovery uh, credit. Eventually, an international consensus was that both these mathematicians were given credit for the discovery. But what about John Gall that was the first one to look at it through a telescope? He's another footnote of history. By the way, 175 years ago, uh, uh, Neptune has... Uh, its anniversary being that long ago, it has just completed its first orbit of the sun since it was discovered 175 years ago, taking 165 years to go around the sun. That's a long year. That is a very long year, and 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 uh, it, it would be tough to do without birthdays uh, that infrequently. So there's a little history about the discovery of this planet 175 years ago. Uh, and it was steeped in controversy. I mean, this was a heated French-British thing. Who would claim honor to that? Of course, the British astronomer Herschel discovered Uranus, and he had that because whoever discovered these things would immediately ascend to the top ranks in the astronomy world and sit on a, 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 a chair of, of uh, astronomical associations and discoveries and so forth. So. And this is and have a new moon crater named after you exactly, and I do think that all three of these astronomers do have craters named on the moon after them. Good, good point there, and probably on some of the moons of Neptune. Well, what about Neptune? Neptune has a bright blue color because of the methane in it. It is the planet that was named after the Roman god of the sea. Okay, what, what, Jessica? Oh, she likes the graphics. She's saying real good. This planet has extreme climate. Its winds are 3,000 miles an hour, the fastest in our solar system. We're looking at the cloud tops there. Most powerful energy in an atmosphere in the solar system. And due to its great distance from the sun, we can never see it with the naked eye. It's 2 billion uh, miles away. It's the fourth largest planet behind Jupiter, Saturn, and Uranus. And, uh, uh, but it's the third most dense uh, planet in our solar system. And this is a very interesting thing because when we slice the atmospheres of these gas giants, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, inside we think is a rocky core because like when you compress anything with the gravity above you, it, it creates heat and, and other elements are created. And we think the pressures are so great near the core of Neptune that yes, diamonds are created. The, near the core of Neptune could be just a, a, a whole thousand mile layer of diamonds. So that might be worth going harvesting for. But Neptune also is a strange world. It has four kind of ropey uh, uh, rings around it. And uh, it's got about two dozen satellites, 13 officially, and then another dozen that are very small that shepherd these rings around it as shown here in this illustration. But this big, largest, one of the largest moons in the solar system, Triton, 
is larger than planet Mercury, okay? And what you see on this taken by our Voyager spacecraft, these dark areas are actual geysers of, of uh, ice being vented out, and that's the shadow uh, that they're casting on the ground. And they call this a cantaloupe surface up there. Uh, so a very strange and large world, frozen uh, 200 below zero all the time. That We think that's nitrogen laying there. There's Jupiter behind it there. It's got a dark spot, like Jupiter's red spot, and these white clouds have been observed from the Hubble telescope. Uh, which is the only way we can see the cloud bands of Neptune today. So Neptune become the, the, the mysterious eighth planet of our solar system on this date 175 years ago. And now you know all about it to stay curious. Another thing we wanted to keep you curious with always on Throwback Thursday, we're going back to 1958, okay? So that is 63 years ago. And what was happening 63 years ago in 1958? It was called the Cold War, and we were in a nuclear proliferation against Russia and probably China. They don't, although China wasn't a nuclear country yet. Uh, in our rocket ranch that we lovingly call Cape Canaveral Air Force Station, then is now Cape Canaveral Space Force Station, was a training ground for nuclear tipped missiles to defend and be an offensive weapon for our country, all right? And here, we're gonna tell you the tale today in 1958 of a Navajo X-10 drone being shot at by a Bomark missile, two of the main missiles of these programs. Now the Bomark shown here was a nuclear tipped surface to air missile and the only one built by the Air Force. The Army developed all these other missiles, okay? And I was just talking today around our, our docent desk to 90-some-year-old Murphy Wardman and his 90-year-old buddy Jack Martin, and they started out at, at the NACA in 1957, and then it became NASA in 1958, talking to them about the Navajo and the Bowmarks because uh, Murphy particularly as an electrical engineer on pad 36, I have great knowledge of this. And I said, on this date in history, Murphy, they used a Navajo drone to be a target for an ex, uh, for the Bowmark shot here. And Murphy's always going to never go Navajo. And the rivalry between 80-year-olds and 90-year-olds about the pride that they were doing for our country is what our museum's all about. One day, this Murphy Wardman, who has been very involved with our museum over the years, and another gentleman met in our lobby and I said, Murphy, this guy worked on the Navajo. And Murphy goes, oh, the never go Navajo. And the Navajo guy got a finger in his face and says, you guys had more money than us. We, did, we didn't do that. And Murphy's just laughing because he was working on the Atlas rocket in the this, this, this second stage Centaur. And later I told him what that was about and he said, it's just a running joke between us old guys here because the Navajo had a bad record of flying. It blew up a lot. It was a test vehicle. This is 1958. And when they blew up something, sometimes they were glad because they figured out what went wrong. And hardly ever, Murphy Wardman says, did one, the same failure happen again. They always corrected one failure. Maybe it was something down the chain that they corrected that wasn't strong enough and they, they replaced it. So what happened in today's date in history is they launched one of these Navajos that was called the drone, all right, and they launched it as a target over the Atlantic Ocean, and the Bowmark missile went, flew uh, uh, towards it and, and at supersonic speed and came within a lethal missed distance. They didn't want to hit it because they wanted to bring the Navajo back. It had wheels on it to land. It was a rocket that could be brought back to uh, uh, the skid strip here at Cape Canaveral. And when they brought this X-10 Navajo back on the skid strip, the drag chute failed and the landing barrier failed and the vehicle ran off the runway and blew up. Now I'll go show you that in a minute. Here is these again, bow marks. Okay, this is not Cape Canaveral, folks. This is, Mag I think it's McGregor or McGuire Air Force Base in New Jersey is where these were babies were at. Okay, nuclear tip now to protect our country from a Russian nuclear attack in 1958. There is the beautiful 
no go, never go Navajo. Sorry, you Navajo guys out there. Don't, don't slam me. We love you. And what they learned from this rocket uh, translated to today's technology that we can't even imagine what kind of spy versus spy intercepting things are going on in today. But in 1958, 63 years ago, they would launch this up and then fire uh, as, as a drone target and then fire some other uh, test rockets at it to see if they could work their whole systems together. This, by the way, is outside of Cape Canaveral Air uh, Space Force entrance over uh, at the Port Canaveral. This is outside the Sands Museum, just freshly restored. And we had Jamie Draper on here last Thursday with my guest host, Bart Martindale. And Jamie did a great show about all the artifacts out there that he is entrusted with. And you can check that out on our archives. So I told you that Navajo uh, tried to land after the Bowmark did intercept it, but it wasn't meant to hit it. And whoops, that's what it looked like when it hit the ground there, Jessica. Uh, and there was always an exciting day when anything was launched at Cape Canaveral in the 1950s, according to our beloved space workers, that uh, many of them uh, that we see on a day-to-day -day basis out here. So hope you enjoy that little blast from the past, literal blast from the past. Uh, people, I mean, Jessica, you, it's hard for you all young people to imagine the threat of nuclear war was a very real thing in the 60s, and I'm a young elementary school kid, and we actually hid under desks and things went down to the basement as if that was going to save us from an atomic bomb. But uh, it was an exercise of alertness and awareness on there. So, yes, Jessica, we have a comment from well it's for me okay. and the fun thing i want to bring up i know we're going to drag my husband on as a guest soon because uh we were stationed at malmstrom air force base and he was a missile facilities maintainer and it's fun that you mentioned the different bases that had different nuclear weapons because now um there's agreements with russia and they're only at specific bases mm -hmm. certain numbers certain rules that that we all have agreed upon as part of the nuclear assurance mission. And that's why we're in Florida, because that job brought us here. Well, cool. Thanks for adding that. Nuclear assured mission is certainly different from uh, mutual assured destruction is what we called the war, Cold War mutual, mutual assured destruction MAD is what that acronym was. And you know, I don't know if we're too far away from that. We might think we are, but with today's technology and China particularly amping up their presence in space with a new space station, they're going to be launching three more Takio knots in a couple weeks uh, in uh, October. Uh, the spy versus spy is still very much going on, and, uh, you know, we got to be grateful for how our national security uh, system is launching new uh spacecraft every day to ensure our safety from space and that's why the space force is its own division actually of course a new military uh, long overdue uh, and uh, a lot of that created the, the space force as you can understand it took things away from the air force and other military so that they could focus on what they do best and the space force people are now all together to focus on what they do best right it's a good way to look at it there. So, Well, one other throwback today is NASA on this date in 1964 was studying the feasibility of a manned orbiting telescope. And we love showing you some retro pictures there of some old space artwork. Uh, look at that astronaut. Doesn't have a jet pack or anything. He's just scooting around no there. Tether. A no tether. <laughs> uh, they do have clouds on Earth. You see a lot of 50s artwork that doesn't have clouds on Earth and our big moon back there. But we were, uh, the space agency was inviting members of the scientific community in 1964 to propose astronomical studies uh, in space. And what developed out of that was Skylab. And Skylab's main scientific mission was studying the sun with its space telescope. And we told you yesterday that the Skylab astronauts in 1975 did a spacewalk to retrieve film. I still have the film canister in front of me here retrieve film from the canisters, a dangerous spacewalk to get the cartridges of data 
that those telescopes were recording and then putting fresh film in there. And this is a Fuji canister of film, folks. Tom and Mark Usiak in Lancaster, Pennsylvania know what I'm talking about. Uh, they're good friends of ours, and uh, uh, we hope that they're enjoying Stay Curious. In fact, they have put together that I'm going to get any day, uh, Jessica, from Tom and Mark Usiak that photographed over 60 shuttles. They are bequesting the museum some of their photos so we can put them up behind us, Jessica, for our backdrops and stuff. So we love all of our friends up there. Hope Mike Gunzel in Oregon's watching us, uh, Sylvia Monaco in Melbourne. I meant to uh, shout, shout out to Hazel Banks because we had the British Bruce Smith on here yesterday, and Hazel has a twin citizenship of Brit, British and English. So uh, uh, jolly that for uh, our good friend Hazel and a, a, a super supporter of the American Space Museum and also the Humane Society here. And wanted to say hi to Dan Vranick in, in Indiana. Hope there's a little bit of chill of uh, autumn in the air there. And uh, George Triolos has uh, chimed in a time or two from his planetarium in Cyprus, as in the Greek island of Cyprus. So we got friends all over the world, and we're so grateful for that. But I wanted to say we miss you, Connie McDaniel. Hope you're getting better. She's a stalwart supporter that, that helps me a lot with our eBay presence. And by the way, we are selling stuff on eBay. We have an auction coming up October 9th that we're going to start promoting the heck out of. Uh, another $200,000 worth of space memorabilia up for grabs, thanks to Chuck Jeffrey, uh, our collections uh, analyst and, and uh, par excellence human being who's put his efforts into literally saving this museum with his auctions. So a lot of good stuff going on, and uh, we want to get uh, our, show our constellation of sponsors that uh, we are asking at least a $100 donation to put you on a new constellation. We're going to reveal probably next week uh, what it's going to look like and start adding names to it, all right? And one of those names we're going to add to is Bruce and his wife, Heather Smith, who were on our show yesterday, made a healthy donation to become a lifetime member of the American Space Museum. So we can't thank all of you enough. We'll put your logo up here to promote you. We're going to start rolling those out next week. Uh, Jessica, uh, she's been very busy uh, doing all kinds of things uh, as cheap development there. Q, Q, you're, you're, oh, you missed my Q there, Jessica. All right, there we go. There she is, cheap development, hatching your dreams into reality. And I was at a community, uh, a, a Cocoa Beach Chamber luncheon today, bragging about her and and you're you're getting known out there for sure, Jessica. Well, and uh, Chamber just commented and said, "Hey, Mark." Hey, hello there, Michelle uh, Goldcamp, probably there, or Darlene. Uh, a great group of people, and we are honored to be the nonprofit of the year from the Cocoa Beach Chamber of Commerce. Our whole staff has worked hard to uh, not just for that goal, but to bring you a great experience in our museum. And now we are geared up to. STEAM education, science, technology, engineering, arts, and math, and of course, outreach with our Stay Curious programs and astronomy programs we're going to start be doing here. So you want to come book your vacations here. I was at Cocoa Beach Chamber today, Jessica, and Cocoa Beach is a town of 11,000 people. They get 2.2 million tourists a year in that 11,000 uh, person town, which is uh, roughly 30 minutes uh, from where our museum is. We're, we're north of the Cocoa Beach, Cape Canaveral area, but you won't regret it coming up here because our beaches are beautiful at Play Linda, and uh, it's a great sp place to view a, a space launch. So we will have with us tomorrow Tales from the White Room from Triple T, Travis Thompson, um, and uh, he's doing a lot better and look forward to a couple tales of him putting astronauts in their spaceships that he did for 30 years. And we have the museums wide open and this is the Florida weather's coming that you're all gonna uh, be jealous about uh, when you see the snow fly. But enjoy the, the first days of autumn now as uh, everybody's getting a reprieve from the hot weather, we hope, and enjoying some beautiful sights as those leaves are changing. So. On behalf of Jessica and Marty, uh, who's taking a little break, uh, I'm Mark Marquette, and we will see you tomorrow with Triple T, 
with Tales from the White Room to bridge the space between us.